For about four of the last five years, this was the view out my window in Uganda, looking out at the rain often falling on this forest. Here in the middle of a continent in Africa, thinking about where does this, all this rain come from? It kind of plays in your head when you're looking out the window. Where does this rain come from? We're in the middle of a continent. Yeah? How come there's so much moisture in the air? So a good question, do forests attract rain? So I'll try and explain why I'm enthusiastic about this question. It's not very hard to justify an interest in water. Of course, water is absolutely basic. Do you want to move around a bit? I'm worried people can't see if I'm waving my arms there. Um, water is absolutely essential for lives and for livelihoods. Life on the planet requires good water supplies. Declining access to water is associated with, as a threat to food security and, of course, to human health. You need water uh, to live well. Uh, if you look up the official statistics, there's been 11 million people killed in drought, 7 million people killed in floods in the last century, or just a little bit more, and many, many people, 5 billion people needing emergency aid. So reliable access to water is a really key thing, whatever you're interested in. If it's the environment, if it's people, if it's livelihoods, if it's food security, it's fundamental. So bringing this back to forests, what do we know about forests? We know that they're a major source of atmospheric moisture. Uh, you can read the literature and find out that deforestation is implicated in a declining amount of cloud cover, a decline in reliable rain, and in various parts of the world there are good correlation studies showing that a declining forest cover leads to a declining amount of rainfall. I should say that I know I'm talking to a kind of a, a cross-disciplinary group, so if I start using jargon or I start talking too quick because I've had too many coffees this morning, which I, may have happened, uh, do interrupt because I'd like it to be informal. If I see that people are lost, then I'm not doing my job properly. So please interrupt. Yeah? Okay, good. Too quick? Okay. So what do we know a bit more about forests and the evaporation? We know that a closed canopy tropical forest will generally evaporate the amount of water which is equivalent to about one to sometimes even more than two meters a year. So this is a huge amount of water. So you can imagine everything flooded in one meter depth of water, and that's the amount of water going into the atmosphere from most tropical forests every year. Huge amounts. Uh, we know that forests are much more efficient at evaporating water into the atmosphere, maybe around 10 times what you would get from grassy or shrubby vegetation, and even more than you would get from open water. So if you talk about a lake versus a forest, we're getting about twice as much uh, from the forest per, per unit area as we are from the open water. Uh, why is that? Well, if you really look at a tree, it's kind of a machine for evaporating water. It really uh, has this high leaf area that are all these things hanging out on the ends of the branches, these leaves. Biologists here, right? Leaves on the end of the branches. You have these tall things sticking up to carry it in the air. It's the same idea as why you hang your clothes up on a clothesline to dry rather than putting them on the ground. You call it the clothesline effect. Your clothes dry quicker, flapping around in the wind on a clothesline in the same way that leaves on a tree evaporate water more effectively the low, shrubby vegetation on the ground. It's the same idea. So why are trees so special? Well, forests themselves have a lot of water in the soil. They have water, uh, soil that's very good at accumulating moisture, these deep organic soils. <coughs> Some experts on that here, I think. <coughs> trees also have incredibly deep roots in some cases, so they're able to access moisture deep in the soil profile. Even when the soil is maybe very dry on top, they may be able to access moisture deep on the ground to keep this perspiration going into the atmosphere. You also find that trees, unlike most other plants, have a big store, a big reservoir of moisture in the trunk, so it can keep transpiring even when the amount of water it's releasing is much higher than it can pull in through the roots. You find that the tree will actually shrink through the day and go as it pushes the water out. There's a store in there. So it can keep transpiring water a long part of the time that herbaceous can. And then the stem is replenished at night more gently. So it averages it out. And you also find that forests are a big source of aerosols. That's the technical word for particles. So any kind of particles in the atmosphere uh, that can encourage water to condense. Now, if you want to have clouds, if you want to have water condensing out of the atmosphere, it really helps to have impurities in the air. It sounds strange, but that's what you need. And forests are a really good source of these impurities. Often it's biological particles. And here's, for example, an image of the Amazon basin in the afternoon. You see the cloud is starting to form here over the forest, but not here over the ocean so much. And a lot of this is to do with the chemistry of these particles being up into the atmosphere. There's a lot of research being done on that. OK, I thought I'd talk you through a few just recent uh, articles that are not so controversial before I get to the more controversial stuff. 
there's been a lot of work recently and uh, talking about the amount of evaporation from land that returns to land, so how much of the rainfall on land is really dependent on moisture that's evaporated from land surface, from forests and from other land cover. There's a nice thesis on that, if you're interested, uh, Van der Ent, thesis about that, saying it's more than half of the evaporation that comes off land actually returns to its rain. So we're talking about really considerable amounts of uh, moisture. There's also a nice study in Nature uh, just a year ago or so that showed that the amount of moisture that coming off the land surface is really dependent on vegetation. Vegetation is responsible for more than 80% and perhaps as much as 90% of all the moisture that's evaporating off the land surface. This was kind of a stunning uh, study at the time because people before that had thought that the percentage was much lower, maybe around 20, maybe 25%. Now we know that it's much, much more. So we're really dependent on vegetation for the amount of moisture that's evaporating off the land. There's also been some nice advances in technology in terms of how we can actually monitor this with satellites that can actually look at rainfall, models that can actually tell us where air is coming from, and telling us that really rain depends on tree cover, meaning where the wind is blowing from. How much forest cover the wind is coming through affects very much the rainfall you get on a given day. Where is the wind coming from? How much forest does it come through? If it's a forested area, you will generally get um, twice as much rainfall. If, as the wind has come across non-forest areas over the last 10 days. Am I speaking too quick? I start thinking I'm speaking too quick. <laughs> <laughs> too much coffee. That's <laughs> okay. So we know that where the wind is coming from, I, that we have good data on this. This is not controversial stuff. I put this uh, picture in here just to remind myself, I'm not just talking about really wet, super wet forests. You get the same results even in deserts, that actually forest cover or plant cover uh, it's really the primary source of evaporation, even in the arid parts of the world. It's not, we're not just talking about wet, humid uh, regions. And that's because trees like this in the Kalahari Desert, with roots down to almost 70 meters, are able to access groundwater. They are a major source of evaporation, even in these really arid parts of the world. If we look at the Amazon Basin, it's a nice example. A lot of people have studied the Amazon Basin. We know how much water is coming out of the mountain of the Amazon every second. One of the estimates here, 209,000 cubic meters of water every second. Huge amounts of water coming out of this, this region, out of the river Amazon. Now, if you think about it over a long period of time, what goes in, sorry, what comes out has to be going in. There has to be a balance. So we can think of it that all this water that's flowing out also has to be flowing in from somewhere, somehow. It has to be coming in. So we're talking about huge amounts of moisture. So how does it get inland? This, is, this was my fun bit, Fanny. She wanted a prize for um, a question. So I read a paper recently where I think a news article in Science talking about Swedish researchers who like to quote Bob Dylan tracks in scientific papers. So if anybody can name me the Bob Dylan track that's the answer to this question, you get a prize. How does the moisture get inland? Blowing in the wind. So to actually understand how rain gets in land, we have to understand how wind is actually carrying all this moisture in land. It's a, it's a pretty basic idea, but kind of important to what I'll be talking about. So if we go back to how climate scientists look at this, we have a fairly uh, simple idea of how actually wind carries moisture in land. Here's a cycle. We call it the sea breeze cycle. It's a thermal explanation. This is a pretty standard explanation. Basically, as land warms up, you get the air over the land area here warming up, the air rises. It's the same idea as hot air balloon, right? Spans, it's lighter, the lighter air rises. As it rises, the moisture in the air condenses, you get rainfall here. Air has to circulate, this is a property of the atmosphere, you can't have all the air ending up somewhere, it has to circulate. So it circulates back to where it's cooler and goes from the sea to a cool place flowing in. So you get this cycle as the air cools, comes back, warms, cools, yeah carrying moisture off the sea inland. Yeah? So that's the pretty much the standard idea. And it's based on Archimedes' principles, so we're going way back to 250 BC. This is a fairly basic idea from way back in time. I didn't think of asking that as a question, but I didn't. <laughs> okay. So we can also see this at a larger scale. Uh, the early ideas of how atmospheric circulation works is basically the same idea. We get the equator is hotter than the poles, so here is where the air is warmer, here is where the air rises, compared to here is where the air drops. You get a circulation going like this. 
So most of the rainfall is here in the equatorial zones. The air dries as it, as it rises, it rains, the air dries, comes back, cools. Yeah. So you get a cycle like that. And that's pretty much, even though it goes back to Edmund Haley, the guy with the comet, by the way, uh, to just the end of the 17th century. Obviously, it got a little bit more complicated. People like Hadley came along. People came along and added the circulation of the, uh, sorry, the rotation of the Earth and the formation of these cell <laughs> systems. It's a much more sophisticated idea, but it's basically the same idea. The engine, the <coughs> energy for this circulation, is basically that it's hotter in the equator and colder towards the poles. It's just a thermal explanation for how this all operates. Yeah? Not too quick. Okay, so what do we know about climate from our models? Well, we have these really, really sophisticated, impressive models. Uh, we can talk about forest loss in global climate models, you know, the kinds of ones that the IPCC are using. How is it that they represent forests? And they have quite sort of nice physical ways of talking, of looking at leaf area index declining. A declining rooting depth as you go from forest herbaceous or to crops or whatever, a change in the canopy roughness. There's all these different variables that put into their system. But there are really, really big uncertainties. And if you look at these IPCC reports, you know, they're impressive. But a lot of the documentation, a lot of the discussion is about the uncertainties, because the uncertainties are really big. It's really hard to do an experiment on the Earth. Yeah? So a lot of this we really don't know, except that we're looking at physical principles. Uh, if we look at these models and what they tell us about forest and rainfall, of course it's really analytically complex, many unknowns. There's lots of strange things going on. For example, I just told you about the thermal model, but that doesn't explain why the Amazon is often colder than the surrounding oceans and still getting huge amounts of wind going in. Uh, if you look at models without actually making them fit and just ask what the basic physical processes would tell you, you'll find that the amount of water in the Amazon should be about half what we see. So that's the best fit models that you have. We're actually not explaining uh, the entire flow of the uh, Amazon in current models. So there, there are acknowledged problems. <coughs> so this was a review last year in science. I'm just trying to show you this to show that there is an acknowledgement that there are problems with the current views and models. So what are climate models? And you see this was a review in science by experts who are looking at the whole idea of these climate models. What is it that the modelers still needed to work on? And they said rainfall over land is largely determined by unresolved processes. That's a pretty strong word, unresolved processes. And they really highlighted that this was true, particularly in the tropics. They couldn't really model rainfall in a realistic way. Yeah? This is the main limitation in current representations of the climate system. So these are climate modelers talking about their models, and they're acknowledging and have this huge problem. This is a major roadblock to progress in climate science. So they're really telling you that this is a problem. They really are acknowledging they don't know how rainfall works. Yeah? That's what, how I read it anyway. Okay. This is a graph from a, sorry, a figure from a paper I did with Daniel a few years ago. But the nice thing about this is just to point out, uh, coming back to my initial question before I subtract rain, we're about to get there. If we look at the globe and we look at uh, transects across forested areas or non-forested areas, going inland from the coast, with the direction of the wind. So rainfall generally will be coming in from coastlines with the prevailing wind direction in land. We find that if we look first at the orange sites here, these are non-forested areas, you get pretty much an exponential decline. And this is what you expect. The rain falls in an area. Some of it recycles, but a lot of it goes away on rivers. It drains out to the sea eventually. So as you go further and further in land, there's less water to recycle. So it has to decline at some uh, way. These, these are best fit lines, of course, the real data is a bit noisy to scan, but these are the best fit. So as you go in land here, across the bottom kilometers in land, up to a thousand meters, sorry, thousand kilometers, two thousand kilometers, you get a pretty dramatic decline in rainfall as you go in land. But if we look at areas where, where we have rainforest or a boreal forest up here, we get a different pattern. We get more or less continuous rainfall. Yeah. It's just an observation, it's just a fact. But then it raises the question, well, which came first, the forests or the rain, right? So as an ecologist, I kind of like these questions. It's kind of fun, you know, so go to Daniel and say, Daniel, do you understand this stuff? So that, that's kind of how I was getting into this. And I was reading the work of these two uh, colleagues, physicists uh, in Russia, Anastasia Makariva and Viktor Bushkov, and they've written some really interesting papers. And a few years ago, I guess when I was still at C4, I was reading a lot about different aspects of tropical rainforest. I was writing a book about tropical rainforest. 
and you know you have different chapters on different topics. One of the chapters is on climate and weather and stuff. So I just was reading the whole set of different <coughs> papers, and I found some of their work, and then I started to say, well, if, it, if what they're telling me is true, this is really interesting. I want to write about this. So I went to various colleagues who know about hydrology, like Daniel, and he helped me talk to other colleagues who know about hydrology, to really find out whether what they were saying is true. Because they're saying that, yes, forests do attract rain. So this is a very profoundly different way. This is not about temperature anymore. They've come up with a way to explain how forests actually play a role in driving winds and driving rainfall patterns. So my role in this was basically to be the bewildered guy on the sidelines initially. I didn't know. I didn't know if it's true. But I do want to try and understand if what they're saying is true. And I should say, these are physicists. A lot of this work has been published in really good physical journals. This is just an example of physical letters A. They've been publishing this stuff in physical journals, peer reviewed. The physicists accept it's true. They've also published a little bit in some of the environmental journals. Uh, this was the example of the first one I was reading, Hydrology and Earth Science Systems, uh, trying to address environmental scientists. But these authors have had a real trouble getting this out to climate scientists. And now I just want to tell you a little bit about the controversy kind of as it currently stands. Uh, I've actually been working, I, I'll, I'll, I'll jump a few steps here because we don't have all day to do this talk, but I've actually been working with these uh, physicists to try and make sure that their message reaches the climate scientists. For me, it's not a question of are the, the, being certain that they're right, but if it's a viable theory, if it's a viable hypothesis, then we should either be able to test it or say that it's wrong. You know, it has to be one or the other. It has to be something we can validly test or there's a logical flaw in what they're actually presenting. So it's really important in science that we present this to the people who feel best placed to judge it, the climate scientists. And uh, so I worked with them to actually produce this paper. I've been collaborating them with, the, with them for the last six years to try and do this. And in a sense, it's helpful that I'm not a physicist and I'm not a climate scientist because I'm always trying to say, what are you set trying to say? What does this mean? A lot of it's about simplifying the message and making sure that we don't just write 17 pages of differential equations but actually give clear English language statements about what it is that we're saying. The problem with working with physicists is they think the differential <coughs> equations are the argument, but for a lot of us as an audience, we say, okay, I don't know, you know, I can't, I can't judge this. But we do have to come up with testable ideas, testable things that we can actually bring data to, to actually test the, sci the science behind this. So, we had this paper in Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics, which is quite a nice journal. Generally, they have a pretty quick turnaround on most of their articles. It's a public uh, online system. You put up your draft paper, it's public. The comments are there in public. And we had the debate going on. And it was quite controversial. It had a lot more comments than normal from outside. Generally, it would take about three months to be approved. This one was hanging for over two years. But finally, finally, we had a lot of discussions uh, backwards and forwards of various people. But it was published with an editor's comment which was a bit unusual, and the editor said, in contradiction to common textbook knowledge, the handling editor and the executive committee are not convinced the paper is wrong. <laughs> okay, so that tells you that they were pretty scared or they were pretty worried about publishing it. You know, all scientific theories are provisional. You know, they're not right in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ultimate sense. But this one is not, uh, they were not convinced it was wrong. So, okay, there's obviously something going on here. So what I want to do is just kind of fill you in a little bit more on the background. Okay, so uh, it's a very basic idea. Earlier I talked about the thermal explanation for what's going on in the atmosphere. And uh, if you did the sort of ideal gas, gas law at physics at school, you'll see that pressure is uh, related to temperature. This is the basic idea. The temperature goes up, the pressure goes up, and the, and the air will rise because the volume expands. This is how we understand it normally. But there's also another one in here in the ideal gas law, which is the number of particles, the number of molecules in the gas. Now what happens when you get condensation, you go from having more particles in the air to having fewer, basically. It's a very simple idea, right? So you also get a change in pressure as um, it, uh, the moisture condenses. Now, there is temperature released, there is energy released in this process, and this is what most of the debate is about, and I'm not really qualified to tell you what's right and wrong, but I can say that there's no clarity about what really happens. So I'm going to skip over the physics a bit. I have articles I can share with you if you're really interested in the physics. But I think what's really interesting for this audience is what it really means. And if we look at the theory itself, what does it tell us? It tells us that areas with really high er uh, levels of evaporation develop the lowest atmospheric pressures. So that means that those are the areas that draw winds into them, that draw moist winds into them, draw air in. 
And there's also positive feedback, because if you draw in moist, uh, moist uh, air, this is also providing uh, moisture for rain, so you can provide more moisture in that point. It provides a positive feedback to actually keep, keep the system running. So this is really important in oceans with big uh, tropical storms and the likes, but that's not so interesting for this audience. And on land, what are the most powerful sources of evaporation? I told you earlier, it's forests. So it's really telling us that forests are playing this really important role in sucking air in. So just to try and talk you through a little bit what we think is going on with the, this new theory. This is not the thermal idea. This is the idea that comes from the Russians, uh, Anastasia and Victor, and uh, the rest of us. So we've published this this year. Um, what we think is going on, if you look at this top one up here, you see uh, the ocean, natural forest, maybe I should use this, the ocean and the forest, higher evaporation over the forest, the pink here is dry air. So we we're starting in a position here where this is a landscape that has dry air everywhere, right? Now the forests evaporate air more quickly. So we go to a situation where this bluer air here is now more, more moisture in the air. So here maybe clouds start to form because you're getting more moisture forming here. There's no wind in this yet. There's no wind. We're just talking about naturally on its own. This is generating more humidity. And of course, after a certain point, we get to a, this side starts to rain. And as soon as it starts to rain, we get condensation happening. We get a reduction in air particles. Particles in the air, the moisture is condensing. And then that leads to low pressure here. And this draws in moist wind off the oceans. So we're actually carrying air inland. Yeah, this is the basic idea. And we've actually tr looked at this as a basic idea. So this could all happen in one day. So you could imagine this is the morning. No winds, the, no winds. And then in the afternoon, you get your big thunderstorms, right? This is what happens. And if we look at this in the Amazon basin, we look at wind directions, and we look at pressure changes, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have time to go into all the technical details, but this pattern more or less fits. So just to go back to what does this all mean, uh, with this idea where you get the most evaporation, you get the wind being drawn towards there, you get the lower pressure. So here, for example, on a desert or a, maybe an open landscape versus the ocean, the evaporation here will be lower than open water. So the air will be drawn this way because condensation will happen here more regularly. You'll get rainfall here more regularly. The air will move this way, drawing the moisture off the land because any evaporation coming off the land here will be drawn towards the ocean. If we have enough forest, then the evaporation over the forest is greater than the evaporation over the open water, because the, the forest has a more efficient evaporation per unit area. So the pressure here will drop because we get more regular uh, rainfall and condensation occurring here, and that will draw air in. And if you look at the physics, and I won't go into it, but it also allows us to look like at the Amazon basin and say, yes, this is a sufficient process if we look at the physics to actually draw the winds right in. So we can actually water the whole Amazon basin with this mechanism. I'm trying to see if people are still awake. Yeah, good. Um, this is kind of a fun a figure. It's, it's a bit of a messy data. But of course, we can't cut down whole rainforests or whatever to test an idea like this. One, one point would be if you cut down the entire Amazon rainforest and make it into a parking lot, you would expect to see a very rapid decline in rainfall as you go inland. That would be one way to test it, but quite difficult ethically to do that. So what we can do is look for parts of the world where the forest switches on and off, which is going to the boreal systems. So during the boreal, the winter time, the forests up in the boreal, the northern uh, latitudes, get all snowy. The trees more or less shut down. There is no moisture tra traveling through those trees. The ground is frozen. There is no transpiration going on. Switched off. You've turned a knob going from transpiration to off. Yeah? So got from having a much higher transpiration than the, the surrounding uh, ocean, you've switched it off. And what we see here, this is a transectric bottom graph here is distance inland. This is the zero. This is in the uh, Siberia. As you go inland, obviously there's terrain effects. This, this affects the data. So there's little uh, changes in, in the landscape that have an effect on rain too. But as you go inland, uh, during the summertime, you see not much change, maybe a little bit of decline. It's a bit noisy. But in wintertime, we see, well, I think it's reasonably convincing. But anyway, we can do this many times in different places. But basically, the pattern fits what the theory would say. That overall, when the forest is switched on, you get much better transport inland. When the forest is switched off, 
you get much more rapid decline in rainfall versus the ocean. Yeah. So I don't really have time to go into everything on this, so just point out that uh, this, this uh, theory has certain evidence to, to support it, I think. This idea that rainfall declines into interiors when there's no forest, but not when there is forest. Uh, it actually resolves this problem I was telling you earlier about the cold Amazon paradox and the idea that runoff is, is I think I've lost something there, the idea that runoff in models is too low because we actually have a different mechanism that explains why a cold Amazon still draws moist air in and produces high rainfall. Uh, it explains why we get a, a decline in the effect over the boreal forest in winter time. And there's a whole list of other things, including sort of power estimates of global circulation and stuff. If you're really interested in this stuff, we have a literature on it. I'm seeing if people are still awake. Yes, good. Okay, so probably if you're going back to my original question when I started coming to Daniel all those years ago, about six years ago now, saying, Daniel, do you believe this? And going around different people who actually know about this stuff, whose opinions I respected. Does this make sense? Because if it does make sense, then it's really important. So, of course, I got various different responses from people. And I've had a lot of email communication with climate scientists and stuff. And one of the main responses initially was dismissal. No, 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 no. We've been studying this for hundreds of years. You know, we have tons of data. We have incredibly complex models. It can't be right. So that was one response. And, of course, that's a bit frustrating. But in a sense, it's also exciting if you think, well... Maybe, maybe this isn't right, you know, maybe the dismissal is, you know, then you say to them, have you looked at it? Do you, can you say where it's wrong? And people are often just saying, well, I'm busy. <laughs> yeah, so it's hard to get a good reason, but a lot of people were dismissive. A lot of people were dismissive. Other people said, yeah, yeah, we've known about this for a long time. We've known about this for a long time. It's a tiny effect. It's, it's, not, it's not important. And some of them even said it's in the models already. At this point, I'm starting to get a little bit curious because I think, well, they can't both be right. Some people I talked to were kind of cautiously interested, and I think that was a, uh, kind of made sense. You know, people who are saying, well, the physics looks to be right. It's in these physics journals. I can't see a mistake. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. It seems a reasonable response, but there were people in that category. Uh, even a small number uh, accepted that it's true. I think particularly in the environmental kind of groups, it's actually quite exciting to have this whole new potential for arguing for forests that it actually really makes this huge difference to regional rainfall. So I think particularly amongst environmental people, they want it to be true. You know, this is an amazing story if it's true. Forests are really generating this huge amount of rainfall, are really necessary for maintaining rainfall. A lot of discussion right now is... is people who've accepted that it's true but are arguing about the magnitude. How important is it? It's not that the thermal argument is wrong. The temperature argument is not necessarily wrong. But how do we balance this? If, if we don't have models that take it into account, it's very hard so far to really talk about how significant this, this uh, forest effect might be. So I think that's where we are right now, is on the magnitude. So just to kind of come back to why it's interesting, hopefully, for you, um, one aspect of this theory that's really important is to highlight that we need forests to uh, maintain rainfall in continental interiors. So if we're like living right in the heart of the Amazon basin and people start deforesting all around the Atlantic coast, you could be in trouble with your rainfall. Your rainfall is likely to decline. And it's even possible, according to the equations, we're just talking equations here, it's even possible to go from a situation with lush rainforest to more or less desert just by switching because there's a positive feedback involved. We can go from a system that sustains itself with the positive feedback to a system where we switched it off and it, the, the positive feedback is lost. We have no rain there anymore. So this technically is possible. So that's a pretty big risk. I think for this audience, there's also real opportunities. Uh, if you look at the equations, it tells us that if we actually could plant a forest across the, Am uh, not the Amazon, across the Sahara, that there would actually be uh, enough power drawing in wind to actually, uh, to actually uh, water those forests. You wouldn't need irrigation. This is, this is what the equations say. I'm not saying it's necessarily true, but it's an intriguing idea. Or at least you wouldn't need irrigation everywhere all the time. As long as you think about the right places to grow, the right weather systems to work with, we could potentially use a system like this to green the deserts. Of course, 
we would have to do it on a big scale. We're talking about climate systems, so the magnitudes there are sort of hundreds of kilometers across. We can't just do a few hectares <laughs> and expect it to water itself. We're talking about expanses of hundreds of kilometers. Uh, earlier I was saying it's a whole new value for forests. Of course, if this is true, then it means that people who live in the middle of continents have to start talking to people who live on the edge of continents. So going back to where I was in Africa, in Uganda, looking out the window at mountain gorillas and rainforests, if the people in Kenya or the people in Congo lose all their forests, then my forest up in, in, in the mountains in Uganda may also dry out. So it provides a whole new regional value that we have to start thinking about. Yeah, potentially. And of course, a lot of what I'm saying is hand-waving. I mean, I think it's really interesting. It's really profoundly important. But we don't really know that much about it. We don't know that much about the ecology, what the implications are for the management of forests. When is it that you would lose these properties? How do you maintain them? Huge policy implications, potentially, and this idea that you are dependent on forest in one place for rainfall in another. So I think there's uh, yeah, a lot of opportunities there. I was going to stop now because I didn't want to go on too long. But you're welcome to talk to me more if you're interested. We have a lot of publications, or I have a lot of publications, my, my own, but also my colleagues, uh, physicists. Uh, if you like the technical stuff, I can share those too. I do have a few more slides at the end if you're interested on, on the arguments that people put forward. But I think I've already, yeah, enough people are paying attention. Yeah, OK, we'll see. I'm ready for questions. Thank you.